One can only imagine what it's like to be in the shoe of a saint, but at the Bada Shoe Museum, you can actually size one up for yourself. Now, here it is. It's not fancy, it's worn out, but it's on display, and it's on loan from Father Thomas Ruzica. Father Tom, why is this shoe significant? Not only is this a shoe, this is one of the shoes, because he had two feet, this is one of the shoes of the Curie of ours, St. John Marie Vianney. He was a priest that lived in the 19th century in France, very poor, humble man, who is now renowned for his humility, for the great art of the Sacrament of Reconciliation that he celebrated so often, a model of holiness. The shoe actually came into the possession of the Bazillion Fathers in France in the year 1850. And I happened to see these when I was visiting our mother house in France and acquired these. And I thought it'd be very appropriate that the Bada Shoe Museum be able to have this on view, especially for the International Year of the Priest that begins on June the 19th. Thus the shoes. I don't go collecting shoes like this. Well, thanks so much for the loan of this shoe, Father Tom. And I'm glad to say that this shoe will be on display till Labor Day 2009. Pope Benedict XVI has announced that the church will celebrate a special year of the priest which will run from June 19th, 2009 to June 19th, 2010. And during this year, he will proclaim St. John Vianney as the patron saint of all the priests in the world. Now, what does this announcement mean for us? Because when I asked a few young people if they knew about the year of the priest, I got this. Really? I did not know that. I have no idea what the year of the priest is. And when I asked them if they knew who St. John Vianney was, I got this. No, I do not know who St. John Vanier is. So if you're in the same boat or you want to take some time to reflect on what this saint and what the year of the priest can mean for you, stay tuned. I'm Marose Bacani and welcome to Catholic Focus. choice by Pope Benedict XVI of St. John Vianney as the, the, the patron for priests and the key figure in the year of the priests takes me back to my third year in the seminary. And at that point, some one of us got a hold of a copy of a life of St. John Vianney. It's that classic life by Monsignor Francis Trochu. And I will never forget reading this book. I devoured it it still remains kind of the classic image of a saint's life for me. And I would say that what happened for me then is what generally happens for seminarians when they first come into contact with St. John Vianney. He becomes kind of the, the image, the model, the exemplar of the priest that we carry forever after. And that has remained so for me. He is the patron of diocesan priests and he lived in France. What I remember from him was that he read people's souls um, when they were in confession. Uh, he really had a, a good understanding of the struggle that people went through and he somehow gave them the truth in love in, in, in a way that was just miraculous. He is the saint that you know models my ministry and reminds me that it's really up to God, not me, uh, to be a good priest and the Holy Spirit to work through that. John Vianney is fascinating because he has this incredible relationship with Christ. He has this passion for the priesthood. The other thing is that he's one of the most inadequate uh, candidates for the priesthood. Probably one of the, by tradition, probably one of the dumbest seminarians that I've ever went to into the priesthood. But he persevered, the inadequate, the impossible, was able to overcome through God in order to confound the proud. We've been performing and creating shows on the lives of the saints and on the gospels in order to bring them to life. The most recent work that we're working on is on the life of St. John Vianney, the curie of ours. St. John Marie Vianney's faith arose out of a time of persecution and war. This humble man was born into a devoutly Catholic farming family in Dardouli, France, on May 8, 1786, three years before the French Revolution. During the Revolution, John Marie's family attended Mass in secret, and fearless priests risked their lives to deliver the sacraments to them. Their fervor and heroism inspired John Marie's love for the priesthood. Although he had a poor academic record, Vianney was ordained a priest in 1815 at the age of 29 and was eventually sent to Ars, a tiny parish with a shabby church, 
few resources, and a lax spiritual life. When he first arrived in ours, a little country parish of about 200 people, it was probably no better, no worse than the neighboring parishes. Uh, the people knew very little of the catechism. This was after the French Revolution and Napoleon. Alcoholism was rampant. There were four inns, as they were called, in that small town. Um, promiscuity was very widespread. Poverty that goes with that lifestyle was typical of this village. About three years after this young priest arrived, things were already beginning to change. And subsequent priests who came to the area were impressed at the depth with which these people could speak of and knew their faith. One key to the transformation that took place in the little parish of ours is the sacrament of confession. As the influx of pilgrims to this little parish began, and at its height, the number reached about 100 to 120,000 people every year, John Murray spent his days in the confessional to reach as many souls as possible. Well, he's known as the most famous confessor. Why is that? Because he spent more time at the confessional than any other priest in church history. In the end, he was going almost 16 to 18 hours a day. People would wait weeks in line just to, get, to go to confession to him. Uh, and so this is important because it brings up another thing for our age is the importance of confession, that the priest really is the counselor. He can't, God uses him to pardon sins, to heal all the wounds that we have done and restore us back to Christ. And although he was not a scholar by nature, John Murray knew that he needed as much preparation as possible for his moments of preaching. He began preparing his homilies in the sacristy, where he could look through the sacristy door to see the Blessed Sacrament. He had a writing table there, and he had his books, Lives of Saints, Books of Theology, and so forth on Scripture. And he would laboriously read these books for hours, go into the church to pray, kneeling before the Blessed Sacrament. Many of the people would not even be able to hear in the packed church the words that this priest was saying. But the way he spoke and the depth of feeling and sometimes the tears that accompanied his words made a deep impression upon people. He will teach us this year of the priest to explore ways as priests and as people in which we can grow in a catechetical understanding of our faith as we know more deeply the truth on which our faith is built. Lay people and priests can take advantage of this year of the priesthood, first of all, by truly starting to pray for priests to learn about St. John Vianney because he's the, the focal point of the whole year, to reflect especially upon the mystery of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, since that is how the, the year of the priesthood is going to begin, since the Pope declared it, so that we realize the mystery, the, the, the Sacred Heart, devotion to the Sacred Heart, is really devotion to the priesthood of Christ, which is the priesthood of all priests, this outpouring of the heart of Christ, the wounds of Christ for all sinners for all souls, to restore them back to himself. Who is a priest? This is the great question that needs to be asked during this year. So we know St. John Marie Vianney had this incredible relationship with God, and he valued the sacrament of confession and the Eucharist as a source of strength and wisdom. And with these, our patron saint of this year of the priest converted countless people. Now his story also reminds us that holiness attracts. People may not always recognize the name John Marie Vianney, but they can always say something about what a good priest is. What makes a good priest is involvement because it makes it more exciting for people to actually want to go to the church when everyone's involved. Priests are important because they uh, are the ones that do the Eucharist. They bring Jesus into it. A good priest is someone that would care, that cares about the people that he's helping. Not that it's his job, but that he actually cares and he wants to help them like in any way that he can. He's like the shepherd. He guides us the right way to God and to Jesus. <laughs> but you don't have to be old to be retired as a no, teacher no. anymore. <laughs> so how are you doing? These kids are doing great. Well, you guys are doing great. Well, that's nice. These are going to be nice. I used to live in Corona, Ontario, and I really enjoyed my priest, Father Jan. 
he used to um, always make jokes and he made it a lot more exciting for youth and things by making different youth groups that made us also involved with the church. Father Richard's a very good priest. He is very into what he does and he makes it very fun going to Mass with him. Father Matt at uh, Most Precious Blood is one of the best priests because he's got really good homilies and he can really speak to us about that day's gospel and how to relate it to uh, real life. If you're going to Mass and not uh, taking something from it, then what is the point of going? This is a wonderful, wonderful celebration. The coming together of God and you. The coming together of God and his disciples. And I want to say to you, thank you. Thank you for opening your hearts to the gift of the Spirit. Thank you for saying yes to continuing to be God's messenger. I'm very proud of you for doing that. I think in their lifetime, um, the, the image and the role of priest has been radically changing, uh, some for the good and some for the bad. Uh, so I, I think it's time really that, that we as priests um, reclaimed our pride in being priests, uh, that we really reclaim our joy in being priests. We're in a day and time where our priests are doing tremendous work. Um, they're tremendous signs of light and hope and faith and generosity of spirit. I'm, I'm grateful for this year. Receive the cross of Christ. 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 We may all be grateful for good priests, but Pope Benedict is asking us this year of the priest to reflect even more on the meaning of the priesthood. And this takes more than looking at what a priest does, but also who or what a priest is. Now, Jesus Christ was St. John Marie Vianney's model and source of strength for his priesthood, and in particular, for his vocation as a parish priest. So let's take a look at what this means. If I may be a, a little bit theological here, I'd like to uh, take us back to the source of what a priest is, and that is Christ himself, who is the high priest. And ask the question, when is Christ, or where is Christ, perhaps most profoundly priest? And I'd like to suggest that it's on the cross that Jesus exercised his priestly ministry most beautifully and most profoundly. And on the cross, what was he doing there? He was giving himself away. And he was drawing all to himself. He said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all things to myself. So it was really an act of reconciliation that he was accomplishing there on, on the cross. So we as priests see ourselves in terms of our identity as people who have been ordained to be sacraments of Christ the priest. Joshua. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we need to see signs. Signs of what? Signs of the goal of our life. The goal of our life is to be in union with God and with the saints and the angels at what we call the banquet of heaven. But really, the life of heaven is a life of perfect union with everyone. And so we're not going to be missing out on anything, even though there is not marriage. So we need signs. We need people in our lives to uh, reveal to us that that life of heaven, where there will be no marriage, can be an attractive kind of life. The so celibates are given to us to show us that the goal of our striving is a beautiful goal. And they're living that life right now. We are living that life right now. Almighty Father, forever and ever. I remember one particular incident that I had had a long day as a parish priest, and I had just sat down for my supper, and the doorbell rang. I thought to myself, oh, should I even answer the doorbell? But I thought, well, you know, it's my call to serve and not just simply to think of my own needs. So I got up and I went to the door, and it was a young woman, and she says, Father, she says, I don't belong to your parish. She says, I'm not a Catholic, 
but she says, I, I, I have some questions. I really need to talk with somebody about these questions. And so I brought her in and we sat down in my office and we talked and she had a chance to just really voice some of her questions that she had about God, about where the world was going, the meaning of her life. And I talked with her about what it is that we as Catholics believed. And knowing the sense that my time was limited, I set up another appointment to meet with her later on. And at that later meeting, we talked about how she could possibly become a Catholic through the RCIA process. And I'm very happy to say that just a few years ago, I was able to celebrate the Mass for her first profession of vows with the Sisters of Service in Michigan. As I look back on my parish ministry, that's one particular example of, of how my, my willingness to just be attentive to the needs of people really opened doors for people. And in this young woman's life, it opened the doors for a whole new way of life uh, where God really is the center of her whole life. Pour les siècles des siècles. When we're celebrating Mass, I think this is one of the times when we most often feel as though we're really being priests. Because what are we doing there? We're reconciling. We are uh, speaking God's word to God's people. We're in the name of God's people, lifting up their prayers to the Father. Also, I'd like to uh, suggest the Sacrament of Reconciliation as a special moment. I think a lot of people might think uh, it must be discouraging to sit there and listen to sins for uh, minute after minute or hour after hour. But I would like to say that it's just the opposite. Uh, we do see the underbelly, certainly, of the life of Catholic people. But more importantly, what we do see is the beauty and the faith. We hear the sins, yes, but what's behind the sin? No one comes to the Sacrament of Reconciliation unless they have faith. So whenever they come to the Sacrament, they're making a profession of faith. And there's nothing more beautiful for we as priests than to see the faith of our people. So I find that after the Sacrament of Reconciliation, there are so many times where I feel compelled to kneel down and to pray in thanksgiving for the privilege of being able to be a part of that sacrament. Pope Benedict is inviting not only the priests, but I think the whole church to reflect on this mystery of the priesthood. I think for priests is a, a sense of renewal of that first original call, uh, to be confirmed in that, to recognize that they, they were chosen, they were anointed. Um, so I think a commitment on our part to a, a call to holiness, a deepening of our prayer life, a commitment um, to our spiritual journey. For the people of God um, to love us, uh, to recognize that in, our, in their midst, uh, we are trying to represent Christ. Uh, yes, we're human. Some of us have weaknesses, but we want to give our gifts and, and serve the people of God. I'm so glad that St. John Vianney is being put at the center of this year. Uh, as I'm reflecting on his life again, there are some things that are surfacing that are really invigorating me. And one is the passion that he had for the holiness of his parishioners, which was of course rooted in his love for God, but that's how it expressed itself in his own life, was a passion for the holiness of his parishioners. He took the liturgy very, very seriously. He spent some of his own money in order to uh, decorate the church up a little bit, to buy vestments that were beautiful. He spent hours and hours preparing his homilies. But one of the most interesting things about his life is that, as I said, he saw his, being, his people being attacked by the powers of evil. And he saw one of his responses to those attacks as an internal battle that he had to carry on. And so um, he took on uh, great and stringent penances upon himself, uh, fastings, etc. And he saw it be, as being at least in part an interior battle where he was battling Satan for his parishioners. Uh, so he's a wonderful model of, uh, of love for God's people and of his willingness and of the willingness to spend oneself in order to, to do that work of reconciliation. In the year of the priest, I think it would be a very uh, blessed time in seminaries. I'm, I'm hoping and anticipating that it will be a year in which those who are preparing for the priest would, will see it as a preparation for themselves. Uh, to recognize the need to be formed 
in the image of Christ, um, to really become in their own heart convinced that this is God's call to them. In terms of uh, dreams for uh, the lay faithful in this year of the priests, uh, there are a couple that I have in mind. One is a very simple and obvious one, is that they pray for their priests. Their priests in their ordination uh, make a commitment to pray for the church every day. So five times a day, we as priests pray for the lay faithful, pray for the whole church. Uh, it would be wonderful if uh, our lay faithful made a commitment to pray for their priests uh, every day. That would be great. I would love it if our lay faithful approached their, their parish priests or their priests wherever and said, Father, we would love to hear from you about priesthood, what you think about it, what you feel. Tell us about it. We're hungry to hear because I think our priests sometimes need a little bit of encouragement. Maybe we feel that our laity wouldn't uh, enjoy hearing about it or they'd be bored by it or whatever. But I think it's just the opposite. I think our people want to hear from us what we have to say. The wonderful thing about being in parish ministry is that you're encountering uh, the church in its, its beauty and its richness because there you've got uh, people from one to a hundred, uh, every possible level of faith, every possible level of maturity, uh, every uh, human circumstance imaginable is there and you're running into it and it calls the best out of you, uh, the best holiness, the best of your skills. I hope the life of St. John Marie Vianney and all we have learned today about the meaning of the priesthood and the life and challenges of the parish priests in particular may start us off on our own exploration of what this year of the priest is calling us to. I hope you enjoyed the show and have developed ideas or programs in your own parishes of how you can live out this year of the priest. If you'd like to order a DVD copy of this program or would like to share with us how you're going to live out this year of the priest, send us an email focus at saltandlighttv.org. Once again, for Catholic Focus, I'm your host, Mary Rose Pacani. We'll see you next time.